We thank you, Father, for your presence in our midst. We are dwarfed by your glory. Even angels who stand before your face on a 24-hour basis, cover their faces with their wings and cover their feet with their wings because of your burning glory. Moses just beheld your back and people could not look upon his face. When John the Revelator met you on the Isle of Patmos, he said, I saw somebody like the Son of Man, like the man I knew who walked the shores of Galilee. Like the man I knew who went to the wedding feast. Like the man I knew who stilled the storm and made Peter walk on, 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 on the water. Like the man I knew who said to us, let us go to the other side and there was a storm. And he spoke to the storm. But this time when I saw him, your eyes saw God were full of fire. Your hair was white as wool. The stature of your wisdom could not have been found them out. Like the hair that covers the head, it can never be numbered. That is your wisdom, the fountain of wisdom that flows from you is immeasurable. And then John said, when you spoke, you spoke with the voice of thunder and lightning. And he said, I could not stand this anymore. I fell. I fell. We prostrate ourselves, O oh God, before you in the spirit and in the flesh. And we say, your glory alone, your covering glory is enough to take us from one place to the other. It is not what we have done. It is not what we have achieved. It is your declaration and your release of your glory upon our lives. It is your glory that makes us different. It is your glory that makes us separate. It is your glory that covers us like the people of Israel. It is your glory that gives them the victory. That makes a way for them. We celebrate your glory. And we salute your glory. Animonium. Any more, any more, yam We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Last week we had a powerful testimony over here, and for the first service people, second service people have come to me and they are saying that, Papa, you are cheating us. So next time, come to both. Well, sorry. But this is all part of the sermon. So, we're going to dedicate a time in August where the second service people will hear the testimony. And normally, first service people is short play. But second service people is long play. So you will hear more details. So get ready. But in view of that, I want to encourage all the young men and young women and everybody who wants to aspire to do business and who wants to excel. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you one secret that God shared with me. I kept saying it, and I lie not. I have seen it over and over again. Nobody's in this church, nobody's become somebody's. I am saying nobody's become somebody's. Grace is available. For you. I said grace is available. For you to excel. Grace is available for you to excel. God is able to pick people. It's not in a, in a church where somebody is already rich. Then they call him. Then they tell him that God is going to prosper him. No. God picks an Abraham who is nobody. And starts him. And by the time his story is over. He becomes the most wealthiest person in the face of that country. Everybody begs him. Please go away from us. May you also begin to count money in such a way. That fear will fall upon you. That respect will fall upon you. That reverence will be given to you. Amen. May you begin to count in the name Jesus. of Jesus. Yes, it is not just only talk. It's not just prayer. Mm. It's also hard work. There That's are principles it. to be That's taught. It. So we're encouraging you. We're going to be having our men's uh, royals, um, business fellowships, a mentorship system. Where we want to mentor people and teach them how to uh, do business and what to do, what not to do. Let me tell you something. First of all, you need to discover who you are. 
in this thing. What type of businessman are you? Where are you coming from? Are you an Abraham? Are you an Isaac? Are you a Jacob? Are you a Joseph? There are four of them. You need to find out who you are. Some people are not Abrahams and attempt to be Abrahams, you will die. It will kill you. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If God places a yoke upon your neck or a burden upon you, he says it is light. That means he gives you grace to carry it. And if you don't have that particular anointing and then you go and walk in it, you don't have that calling, you don't have that purpose, and you attempt to go and walk in it, you might run into trouble because grace, even when you are walking in it, and even there are mistakes, God takes delight in your mistakes. I said, even if you are walking in the calling and you even make mistakes, God takes delight in your mistakes. Why? Because he says, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in your weakness. So at the moment when your back is to the wall, at the moment where there are tears in your eyes, he will supply you grace. And you, can I tell you something? He will do a miracle. He will do something. He will provide a way. He will make a way. He will make, make you meet people. He will make you, a, a door that looks impossible is going to open. It's going to open. Am I talking to somebody? Yes, because that's where he has asked you to walk. But if you are not walking in that place, he is looking for you at where he has appointed you. So if God tells you to go to Zarephath, and you are still at the brook Cherith, and you are uh, meandering around the brook of Cherith and praying and believing God and binding and losing. That why is the water not flowing? Why are the ravens not bringing me bread? You will stay at the, at the brook called Cherith and pray every prayer that you can. God is not going to show up there. Why? He's waiting for you in Zarephath. To every calling of God upon your life, there is also a geography. The geographies are, can be spiritual, can be emotional, can also be physical places. That's where he calls you. People need to understand that our God is not a by heart God. God makes you appreciate small beginnings. And with those small beginnings, he begins to take you up. He takes you up. The, the, pep, the plan of God is always the seed. It is the seed. Then the seed becomes a tree. Then the tree begins to bear forth fruit. Anything that doesn't start as a seed is a problem. That is against God's order of things. So your business starts with a seed. It starts with the, the testimony we had was blowing last week. Somebody started with a wheelbarrow. And he was filling, he was filling borrowed wheelbarrows and was filling trenches and was filling potholes in streets. A young man, virile, nice guy, but he was, he was filling trenches. Today you may not want to walk uh, with a wheelbarrow. Because you feel too big. Today you may not want to um, jump into the gutter and clean the gutter. But I want to tell you this. God always starts with a seed. It is a seed that grows. That becomes a tree. Then it bears forth fruits. And the fruits begin to be experienced by all. If something doesn't start as a seed. And you see the thing just shoot up. There's always a problem with it. It has a short lifespan. It has a lifespan that will not last too long. So you need to recognize don't be afraid of the seed. Don't let others mock at the seed. But you, you have a commandment. Never laugh at your small beginnings. Ha hallelujah. Am I saying something? Yes. Never lack at your, never lack your small beginnings. God always starts small. A, God wanted to populate the earth, the seed of Adam and Eve. God wanted to bring redemption to everything. One grain fell into the ground. That is Christ, the seed. Whatever God wants to do, always a seed. Now, sometimes you may laugh at the seed, and then you would say that, oh, um, what do you call it? This one, yeah, we've seen it. The Bible says, let everybody else laugh at you, but you yourself don't despise small beginnings. Hallelujah. Have something in your heart that says, I'm going somewhere. Have something in your heart that says, God can make something out of me. You understand? Hey, when they laugh at you, say in your head, they laugh at the seed. Why? Because sometimes the seed always looks impossible. Why? Because the seed hides under the ground. Nobody sees it. So sometimes God hides you under the ground. But they should wait. Something is moving. Something is waiting. Something is breaking forth. Something is coming out. And then when it comes out, and then it becomes a mighty tree. Always 
God starts with a seed. Never ever despise the seed. Hallelujah. Don't let anybody push you to despise the seed. Don't let anybody laugh at you or make you lose confidence in your seed. The seed is all that God needs. And when God speaks concerning the seed, you, you understand. Hey, the Bible says, he gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Some people are holding their seed and eating their seed as bread. And they are expecting harvest. No. Put your seed into the soil. Be confident enough. There's a parable of a, of a, of a, of a talent. The man who failed, the man who failed, some were given five talents, they excelled. Some were given three talents or two talents, they excelled. But the man who failed was because he walked in fear. He walked in fear that this seed will not grow. Nobody under the sound of my voice has been sentenced to failure. In the name of Jesus, may grace be made available for you to excel Jesus. in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Am I, am I talking to somebody? Yeah. So get ready for this, the second part of the testimony and get ready. We want to bring up young people. We want to train them. We want to teach them how to do business, what to do, what not to do. You understand? As some of you, you go do business. They give you money. You went and borrowed the money. You know, you, you are a borrow. And it is not wrong to borrow. It is not wrong. Hallelujah. You see, you don't know that. It's not wrong to borrow. What you do with it. When Elisha, the people said, go and borrow vessels. So sometimes you borrow. But the many of us, when you borrow, then you spend it on uh, designer clothes. So look at somebody right now and say, that's nice. Tell the person, that's nice. That what you're wearing is nice. But I hope it's not, I, I, I tell the person, I know it's designer. Come on, clap for the person, you know it is designer. I know it's designer. Even if it is bent down boutique, it is still designer. I know it's designer. But tell the person, I hope you didn't borrow money. I hope you didn't borrow money. To go and do this. To go and do A this. young man I knew, one time, I mean, comes to me and he said, every Saturday, he borrows money from his girlfriend to go and buy a jacket or something. So that he'll come to church with it. Are you? Uh, yeah. Are you wise? Why are you borrowing money? To go and listen. Sometimes you need to come as you are. Hallelujah. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Be yourself. I remember going to church. And other place. You know. They were casting out demons. There was a demon of poverty. And that demon. At that time the teaching was that poverty is a demon. So they knew that I used to wear one pair of trousers every time. I used to call it the evangelistic trousers. I'll tell this story over and over again. They used to laugh at my evangelistic trousers. A sister said to me, uh, Brother Marco, I was passing by your house and I saw your trousers hanging. I think you have washed it. That meant you were in the house. You understand what that means? So without the trousers, I can't move. And you know, I just, I just kept quiet. They called me forward and made me kneel down to pray and cast out the demon of poverty. And people were laying hands on people, were even hitting my head. By the name of Jesus. And I was just saying, oh God, please, deliver me. <laughs> Lord, deliver me. They were asking for my deliverance from poverty. And they were laughing. And they were, I mean, I said they were laughing. They were praying. Serious prayer. People were sweating over me. I mean, casting out the demon of poverty. And I was just there, my hands were this thing. And I said, and I kept saying, Yawo nyami eja. Yawo nyami oba. Miwo nyami susu koko ona na yebe. Were praying for me, I was saying in my head, nobody's destiny is written upon the forehead of his face. The person sitting by you, you don't respect, he will shock you tomorrow. And God will always, you see, that's why there are some enemies, God doesn't want them to die. When you pray for them to leave, the more you pray for them to leave, that's to die, that's when they leave more. That's when you meet them at restaurants while you are buying water, they are buying drink. God is just preserving them for that day so that when they see what he can make out of nothing. When they see what God can make out of nothing, then they would know. 
I'm always encouraged. Those people prayed for me. When they closed the service, if you have ever seen a Christian world, Jekyll, that was me. I was by the wall, sliding by the wall, you know, and walked all the way to La. You know one thing? I want to let you know this. The next day I was, the next time I was there again, I was sweeping the floor, cleaning everything. And one lady looked at me, who is my friend to today, and said, are you here again? And I said, yes, I'll be here. I'm here. I'll be here worshiping even when it is easy. easy. I'll be You know the story has changed? That same person who laid hands on me for the demon to be casted out. And he was there. I remember one time he, his wife came to me and said, do you know that your friend has no shirts? All his shirts are finished. He doesn't have new shirts. So I said, oh, is he in town? He said, yeah. I said, bring him. Then the man came to me and said, truly, I don't have shirts. I brought out a whole suitcase of new shirts. I had not worn before. Somebody just dashed me. And I said, please. And he said, oh, he picked two. And I said, only two? No. Take the whole suitcase. Hallelujah. You get it? Recently, I met him somewhere. Then he said to me, you know what? You were the surprise factor amongst all of us. I say to somebody, you are the surprise factor. Can I get somebody to agree with this? You are the surprise factor. You are the biggest surprise factor. Do you know that sometimes when a baby is full of glory, you may not even see it. Why? Because there's always a story of a baby lying in a manger and the hands have been wrapped and the feet have been wrapped. You can only see the head, but you may not see the feet. You may not see the hands. But that same baby lying in the manger, those feet are going to be walking on water. Those hands are going to be healing the sick. There's something about you nobody else knows. Uh, I said, there's something about you nobody else yeah. knows. There's something about you they don't even believe. Uh -huh. Am I talking to somebody? Yeah. There's something about you they didn't see. They didn't see early. There's something about you they didn't touch early. Why? Because sometimes you need to be protected. And God uses the, the cuff of his hand. That is the close hand of God to keep you and to block you so that people cannot see you. You are only being protected for a while. Jesus. You are only being protected for a season. Ah. When the time comes and God lifts up the hand, Jesus. what is coming out is powerful. Ah. What is coming out is dangerous. Amen. What is coming out is more bigger than everybody Amen. else can say. Come from your chest and they are just talking about me. They are just talking about me. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Please be seated. There's something that I see about God. Like I said, you are always a purpose, so you are not a mistake. Sometimes you have not discovered purpose because you have not met the right people. Sometimes you can be like Joseph in Genesis chapter 37. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 37 from verse 14, I think. The Bible says, uh, Genesis chapter 37, um, no, verse 18, all right. No, 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 no. 17. No, 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 18. Say, before, before uh, 16, okay. No, uh, 15, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, what seekest thou? The title of this message is pointers and, uh, what do you call it? Um, no, 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 managers. 
There are some people in your life who are going to be pointers. There are some people in your life who are going to be showing you the way around. There are some people that God brings to you. You have to meet them in certain geographies of your life. And when I talk about geography of your life, maybe an experience. Certain experience junctures of your life, you have to meet those people. And the Bible says, a certain man found him. A certain man found him. And the Bible says he was wandering, read that place again, and he was wandering in the fields. Wandering in the field. I mean, he was searching. That word, the Hebrew word that was just there, he was searching. He was praying. He was asking God, what should I do? Where should I go? Where are my brothers? You know, sometimes God pushes you out of a comfortable place and places you in a, in a, in a place you don't know. When I say places you in a place you don't know, I don't mean that it takes you from La, then it takes you to Osu. Then you say, oh, I don't know. You know it's Osu. No. But there are certain geographical junctures of your life, of your life experiences, of your work with God. It pushes you from a comfortable place. And that comfortable place is called Hebron. It's a place of comfort. It's a place of encouragement. It's a place of, uh, what do we call it? A celebration. It's a place of covenant. So Hebron was a place where jo Joseph moved. And his father said, go. Some of us are marking time in Hebron. Because we are enjoying the coat of many colors. And that coat of many colors has become a trap for us. Maybe we are working within the confines or the armpits of our fathers. And we are working within the ambit. I intentionally said ambit. Yeah. We go, Emma, we chengashi. So you can't see anything. Or sometimes, yes. Wafau, we share wa. Eh? Boto? Well, wafau. And see. You are so covered. And then you are comfortable. But sometimes God needs to move you out of that place. Because the coat you are wearing is also a coat of restriction. You are enjoying the coat so much, like Joseph, enjoying the coat of many colors that you don't want to step out. You don't want to come out. You don't want to take a risk. But the father said, go. And so sometimes there are situations and circumstances that forces you to go. That comes to attach your level of comfort. It attacks your comfort. It attacks your celebration. It attacks your, 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 the covenant. It attacks your convenience. It begins to wear away everything. God said this to the people of Israel. He said, remember how, like a mother eaglet, I stared the nest. And then I picked you on wings of eagle. The only way the little eaglets will learn how to, how to, how to fly is when the mother eagle, you know, when they're building the nest, they build the nest, first of all, with thorns and briars and sticks and all those things. Then they cover it with pelts. That is skins of animals they have taken and then feathers and all those. So there's a soft uh, inner layer. And then there's a little bit softer uh, wood, this thing. But then there's the thorns and all those other layers. And sometimes what the eagle does, it is time for the eaglet to fly. But the eagles, eaglets are enjoying the comfort of that particular place. So the mother eagle then begins to remove the comfort. Remove the pelt. Remove the feathers. And then we'll take the children or take the itch chicks or the eaglets, put it on their wings, take them far up. And when they take them far up, and then it will drop them. And then they'll begin to say, ah, mama, mama, is ma, what is happening? And then Papa Eagle will fly down. When they are just about to hit, when they are about to hit the rocks, they will pick them up. Then they say, yeah, yeah Papa showed up, Papa showed up. I know Papa will show up. Do this a couple of times. And then we'll remove him. So the thorns and things will make them uncomfortable. You want to get out of that. Something is happening to you. You don't like it. It is time for you to move on. But sometimes what we do is that we begin to pray. Hey, let there be more pelt. Let there be more feathers in the nest. In the name of Jesus. Hey, Father. No, 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 no. God is moving the marbles. God is moving you to higher heights. And then on one occasion, when they lift them up, when they throw them up there, Papa Eagle won't come around. And as they are going to hit the rocks, in desperation, they begin to cry out. They flap out their wings. Then they realize that, oh, we can fly. Yeah. I believe I can fly. Then they begin to sing, I believe I can touch this guy, but I won't go to prison. <clears throat> you understand? Then they begin to fly. Then they begin to soar. God says, there are ways in which I teach you, I bring you to maturity with my purposes. There are ways in which. 
So God had to use his father to orchestrate for him to leave that place. When he was leaving, his father didn't know that he was not going to see him until he sees him in glory. His brothers or nobody else knew that this departure, he was not coming to his father's house again. But the next time they see him, they're going to see him in power and might. They're going to see him in glory. There are some people who have not seen you for a long time, but the next time they see you. Am I talking to somebody? Next time they see you. That's somebody. Next time you see me, you. The way you have been, you have been treating me. You come and sit beside me in church. Tell the person. You won't clap for me. You won't put your hands in your wallet and give me something right now. You have intentionally turned your head away as if you are, I'm not, uh, I'm sitting by you. Look at me. Hallelujah. So God sends him out of that place. And in Shechem, he's wandering. He's lost. He doesn't know what, what to do. What to do next. He's wandering. If the man at Shechem had not found him, Joseph will still be wandering till today. Purpose will not be achieved. And because God has plan B, he will look for plan B. One way or the other, somebody must be placed in Egypt to save Israel. So, if plan A fails, I got 7,000 plan B. You have been ordained to com command wealth that will break the, the boundaries and that will shake the, the cities and that will shake this. If God, can, if Bill Gates can become this powerful, a child of God also can become powerful. Hallelujah. It is not time for some of you, you'll be moving into contracts outside Ghana. You'll be moving into places and occupy certain places outside Ghana. In the name of Jesus. I, why are you sitting down? Looking at, uh, you see, you, you are small. You, you don't think big. When God, Abraham was talking to God and telling God, I don't have a child. I've made all these promises. Then God said, look up. Look to the stars. He said, that's what I'm going to make you. If you don't look up, if you don't see yourself above and multiplying above just what you have or don't have, if you don't see it that way, you can never possess it. Whatever you see is what you have. Because the principle of God is, first of all, you see it. You don't see it maybe physically, but you conceive it. You see it with your spiritual eyes. Then it becomes a seed in the womb of your spirit. Then you begin to nurse it. Then you begin to encourage yourself with it. Then you begin to do things with it. Apply principles to it. That is what we well, If you don't see yourself as uh, international, me, I see myself international. Hallelujah. You know, people may not accept what you are saying, that you are an international person. In fact, when Jesus said he was a prince of peace or whatever, a son of God, they said no. But when they crucified him, did you see what they put on the cross? They put it in different language. This is the son of God. They put it in Hebrew. They put it in Greek. So, they all became translators and they were putting it. I just said, whatever God has used to use you to achieve in the micro, he wants to do it with you in the macro. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I declare the arena of the international years. Amen. May your feet begin to walk in that place. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Spread out Spread and don't out. be afraid. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So now, you need somebody, a certain man found him. When he found him, he said, what are you looking for? You know, then he said, I'm looking for my brother. Then he pointed out Last week we shared on pointers. You need people who will point you. You need people who will make you cease wandering. You need people who will make you stop going around in circles. Sometimes just a word from th that person. Sometimes just a telephone call from that person. Sometimes just, just a word. And you know one thing? Don't point us. God can be a pointer. God can, by revelation, give you pointers. So God can use his vessels to speak into your life. I remember a, a young man, a Muslim, came to my house. He, he was an Odadia and he was talking. And he was telling me what he wants to do. And as he was talking, I was just listening to him. Then I said, one, two, three. He got up, walked back and forth. And he said, Numwe, that's why they call you the Godfather. Kwe, kwe, Numwe. He said, what, what do you have to tell me? Then he began to write. He began to write. 
He's implementing those things right now. And the last time he sent me a copy, he sent me a copy of an international conference that he's organizing, that people are coming from everywhere. And then I wrote, and I, where is my, where is my, uh, uh, right, right. Uh, uh, and then he said, I will donate to Presec. So I wrote, it was Presec who gave <laughs> uh, But it's okay. It's okay. God is my source. He'll find a way to look after me. Now, li listen to this. So you need those pointers. So God, from your pastor, or from the word of God, a revelatory word of God can change your life. Last week, a lady was in front of me. She was also talking. Then I said, have you tried this? And she had reached a junction. And that junction, she didn't know what to do. She said, should I stay? Or should I go? I looked at her. When I started talking, she just said, I know what to do. I know what to do. I said, what do you want to do? What I just used was, what God uses you to accomplish in the micro is an indication of what he wants to use you in the macro. What God uses to accomplish with you in the small is always an, an idea of what he wants to use you to do in the big. God used Moses to deliver an Israelite from an Egyptian. God used Moses to try and separate two Israelites. When God needed a deliverer on the bigger stage, he brings Moses. When God needed someone who would be a lawgiver, a judge, he brought Moses. In fact, one of the people asking, the Israelites asking, who were fighting, who made you a judge over us? Sometimes people can see where God wants to take you, but you cannot see. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. There are people that God knows. They, they know. God can give a revelation. God can also speak peer group. God can use little ones to speak. God can use father figures over your life to also speak over you. But that is not just yes, all. Apart from the pointers, you also need another set of people. We call them managers of your, of your transition. The reason why I'm saying that is that God deals with you in transitions. He will move you from one degree of glory to the other. Every day has its own story. Every day has its own challenges. Every day has its own laughter. Every day has its own tears. And God uses, deals with you. Don't tell me that there are times you have not cried. Don't tell me there are times you have not sat down and even wondered whether God is for you or not. Don't tell me there have been times you have not sat down and wondered whether God is in town or not. We all go through. Can I give you some good information? Even his son asked him, Papa, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? It is part of God's dealings in your life. And sometimes you need to accept. If you, if you can accept the good, then sometimes be mature in handling the bad. Am I talking to somebody? So Joseph meets this man, and this man gives him. But in, in, in First Kings, in First Kings, there is a story over there. And I'd like to just pick a, pick a principle and then we close. First Kings chapter 19, verse 16 to 21. Now we're going to look at the managers. We have seen the pointers. We have shown who the pointers are. Indicators of a pointer. For you to be able to recognize that this person is a pointer. But what about the managers? What about the managers? God also brings managers. They help you navigate the road. Pointers show you the road, but managers walk you through the road. Pointers are like signboards. They won't go with you. Drink, drink club beer. It is not drinking. The wood over there is not drinking club beer. You to go and drink it. Who will walk with your head down? You understand? So pointers may not necessarily go with you, but managers would walk with you. Managers would walk with you. And sometimes you need to understand, it is not every, every time that you will see God walking with you. If you are somebody who believes that you see God, 
every day working with you, you are a liar. Why am I saying this? Look at Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That was quite a braggadocious statement. That was a bragging. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Mm. Then look at what he says. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Oh man, God brings me to abundance. He makes me lie down in abundance. And by, then he continues to say, he, he leads me beside the still waters. He refreshes my soul. You know, sometimes God also brings you to waters to refresh your soul. Now, here's a difference. There's a difference between your body, your soul, and your spirit. So God doesn't bring you to fresh waters to uh, refresh your body. He doesn't even bring it to refresh your spirit. He brings you there to renew your mind. God brings you to those people to renew your mind. Because as you walk, as you travel this journey, you begin to pick up things. And some of those things that you pick up, it's not God. Some of the things that you pick up, it's not God. So God brings you to a place where he begins to wash you with the water of the word. The Bible says you are clean by the washing of the water of the word. It is those who step out and walk on pathways. They gather dust on their feet. If you stay in the confines of your room, you won't gather dust. But when you step out, your feet will collect dust. And so from time to time, Jesus will bring you. And then he says, sit down. And then God takes the water and then begins to wash your feet. He is washing the dust of your feet. He is taking the things that will weigh you down. The things that will make you, your traveling journey heavier. He is taking it off from you. He is washing the feet. And if he doesn't wash your feet... Then you can't make it. Your feet will be caked with dust. Your journey will be prolonged. Your distance will be longer. You can't make it. But he washes the feet. So what, 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 what is he doing? So that you can now stand and say, he will make my feet like the hind's feet. Hallelujah. So God brings you to places sometimes to clean you by the washing of the water of the word. You have collected a lot of rubbish on your way up. You have collected some bad habits. You have collected some things that are not God. You have, you have acquired things. You have uh, worked with people who have taught you all the wrong things. You have, you have collected a lot of rubbish. Your feet are heavy. When I say collected rubbish, I'm not talking about, let me tell you something. When God spoke to the devil, he said to him in the Garden of Eden, he said, you crawl upon dust and you eat dust. Crawling upon dust and eating dust. The dust, that is the domain. The devil dominates dust. And he, he, sat, he gets satisfied with dust. So things that satisfy the devil, your feet have been clogged with it. And that is what hinders you. That is what sometimes becomes a weight. So that instead of running, you can't run. So Jesus brings the disciples to the table and says, let me wash your feet. So by the washing of the feet, he's removing all that. So now you can say, like Habakkuk, Habakkuk 3, he maketh my feet like the hind's feet. God makes your feet lighter. Your journey becomes lighter. Your journey becomes shorter. The distance gets covered by grace. Then when they are said all done, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So now God begins to lead you in principles. And God begins to teach you principles on how to do things, how to work, how to be honest, how to do things, how to, you, you understand? God leads you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He attaches his name to you and his name is attached to you. So when you begin to mess up, when you begin to do the foolish things, the glory gets distorted. But when you begin to rise and when you begin to excel, because God knows that the glory of God is inseparable from the honor of his children. When a child of God is honored, God is glorified. When a child of God is dishonored, everyone puts their face down. When they come and tell you that Reverend Ernest, they saw him climbing a tree like a lizard. He was flying the night. Reverend Ernest has become this thing. Then you say, hmm, Reverend Ernest, you understand. The shame of Reverend Ernest becomes a, st a stigma or a slur on the glory of God. The glory of God is inseparable from the honor of his children. When God is... When children of God are honored, God is glorified. That was why David said in 2 Samuel, you know, when he said, how are the mighty fallen? He said, the glory of Israel lies laid upon the high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath and publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon. You know, why? 
Let the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Let the daughters of uncircumcised triumph. God attaches his glory to you. Am I talking to somebody? You are a reflection of God's glory. That was his initial intention. When he said, let us make man in our own image. I want you to be a reflection. So whatever you do, keep this in mind. That I am a reflection of his glory. Now in Second Samuel, in, 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 in First Kings chapter 19, let's read it. And Jehu the son of Nimshi shall thou anoint. I'm talking about managers. Jehu the son of Nimshi shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elishua, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Well, here's the thing. Some names are coming up. No, no, just there. Some names are coming up. One is, one is Jehu, son of Nimshi. And then another one is Elishua, the son of Shaphat, and Abel-Meholah. Hmm. Now here's the powerful principle. Look at this. When God, and listen to me carefully. When God was introducing Elijah, he introduced and Elijah the Tishbite. His origins were not known. Nobody knew where he was coming from. So he was just introduced as Elijah the Tishbite. Can I tell you something? If nobody introduces you, if you don't get people speaking over your life, if you don't get people correcting you, if you don't get people showing your way, you will rise fast, but you will disappear fast. So Elijah was, one of the, Elijah was one of the most powerful men of God in the Bible. But the way he appeared, he also disappeared the same way. He appeared from nowhere, but then he disappeared nowhere. You see, God is a God of order. Everything comes from something. So that's why when you're reading the Bible, he says, and this person begat, and this person begat, and this person begat. God wants to show you that people originated from somewhere. Hallelujah. You didn't just step out and come into the world. Plop, then you are just walking into the world. You are a dangerous person. You are a ghost. You are kakamotobi. You come from somewhere. And therefore, there are people that Eli Elijah was introduced at Elijah the Tishbite very powerful, but he didn't have somebody speaking into his life. So he couldn't handle discouragement. He couldn't handle despair. He, can't, he couldn't handle disappointment. He couldn't handle threat. He can call down fire, but he can't handle the little things. You may accomplish great things, but a small thing will lock you up. Why? Because nobody is speaking into your life. If Elijah, if Elijah had a father, and then he had gone to say, he had run to his father and said, this Jezebel is threatening me. The father said, do you know who you are? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Don't you know that no weapon found against you shall prosper? He said, don't be afraid of the, of the arrow that fly by day, nor the, nor the pestilence that cometh by night. And I said something. God is with you all the time. But sometimes in some moments, you won't see him. It's in the Bible. David said, he leads me. He does this thing. Then look at what he said. He said, yea, though I walk in the valley of a shadow of death. Huh. Every time he said, God, he did this. He did that. He did this. When he came to the valley, the low moments, the tearful moments, the crying moments, God wasn't around. Was David the only person? He did it to his own son. His son said, Papa, why have you forsaken me? Why, why, why do I feel alone? Why am I in tears? Why am I in pain? Why am I going through this? Where are you? You sent me. He didn't show up. And at that time, can I tell you something that is very important? It's not your prayer. It's your decision. He said, Yet though I walk through the valley of a shadow of fear, I will pray no evil. I will fast no evil. I will bind no evil. He said, I will fear no evil. I'm going to make a decision in my mind. 
that, hey, God, even though I don't see you, you are still around. You, I know you. <laughs> you get it. You are still around, but I can't find you. Do you know why I know you're still around? Because he said, if you go through the waters, I will be with you. If you go through the fire, I will be with you. So I don't see him, but I know he's still around. I still know that he's working it out for me. And he's doing something I can't see. He's doing something I don't know. Can I, can I ask you a question? Three men went into the fire. And then a fourth man joined them. Did Shadrach, Meshach, and uh, Abednego, or Shadrach, Meshach, my friend called Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, did they know that there was a fourth man with them? Did they themselves see the fourth man? No. But somebody outside looked at them and said, mm, we put three people over there, but when I count, there are four. So you don't see the fourth man, but those who gathered against you and those who thought you would die, and those who thought you would fail. And those who prophesied your, your, your failure. And those who said nothing is going to happen. They will see the glory of God. And they will see that there is somebody with you. That is why they call you. They say, you, you are lucky. It's not because you are lucky. Somebody is beside you. Hallelujah. Yeah. Am I talking to somebody? Yeah. This is for you now to say to me, hey God, are you, I know, yes, I was with the I, I fear no, for I know you, you, you are with me. <laughs> you can even hide your face, Charlie, I've got you, I've got you, you are with me. So because you are with me, I wouldn't be afraid. Do you understand what I'm saying? Never ever come to the place where you think he has forsaken you. He's right there. I said, he's right there. Your adversity may make you wear dark glasses so that you can't see God properly. But he's always there. He's always there. And you need to make up your mind. You need to decide that I am not afraid. He's with me. Hallelujah. So it's a decision you make. Now God tells Elijah, they said, for Elijah he appeared, but Elijah he had the father, the son of Shaphat. So who speaks into your life? Who corrects you? Have you become a law unto yourself? In such a way that correction is grievous to you. Have you gotten into a place where no one can tell you anything? Okay. Listen. Watch all ministries that come from nowhere. They end up nowhere. Watch it. I'm telling you, watch it. Have you read the parable of the, of the sower? The seed that was sown. Is there some fell in, in, among thorns. And the cares of this world choked it. And the Bible says, some sprung, some fell by the wayside. Hear the word that the King James used. They sprang up. So the seed that was on, boom, the seed just came up. And then the Bible said, it died because it had no roots. Sometimes the things that God is taking you through, he's just making you dig roots. So that no wind is going to blow you. He's digging you deeper. That somebody is getting deeper. It's getting deeper. It's getting deeper. Yes. So that then you can say, I have an anchor that keeps my soul steadfast and so while the peace I'm fastest to the rock which can not I'm grounded the second thing when we close so God goes to say this person is coming from somewhere people who don't come from anywhere they may be but they don't last but people who come from somewhere because they've got somebody to teach them they've got somebody to do something to them they've got somebody to show them how to do it the glory of the latter house is always greater than the glory of the former if you have not built a house before and you don't talk to people who have built a house. You go there, pata, 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 pata. Then when the Osuko affair, when they bend the Osuko affair, you understand? Then you begin to sweat. Because Charlie, uh -huh. now, you, you have gone to take away tea. Yet you are biting, you can't bite. You understand? Because nobody is instructing you. Nobody is teaching you. Hey, we need people to teach us. We need people to show us the way. God has a way of bringing people. There is a responsibility that men must do for you. If God does it, God can be arrested and taken to court and fined. 
I'm telling you this. I know you got his word. God, all of you believe that God can do everything. There's nothing God cannot do. It's a lie. It's a lie. There are things God cannot do. God cannot lie. God cannot go back upon his work. So what are you saying, God? There's nothing. What he cannot do does not exist. What he cannot do exists. What kind of theology is that? There are things God cannot do. God cannot lie. So if you, if you read the story of uh, Micaiah and uh, uh, Jehoshaphat and Ahab, when they were going to battle, God said, what can I do to uh, let this Ahab, I want to kill Ahab. What can I do? Then the Bible said, a spirit came and said, I am going to be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. So then God said, okay, me, I can't lie. But if that's what you want to do, you go and do it. So me, I won't lie. So the closest I've seen God coming to lie. Why are you laughing at me? The closest I've seen God coming to lie was when God sent Samuel to go and anoint David. And Samuel was on his way. God, Samuel told uh, God, when Saul hears, he will kill me. Oh. Then God said, okay. Okay. Um, say to Saul that you are going to sacrifice and you are going to eat the feast with uh, Jesse. But God said that. It was not an initial intention. But <laughs> Reverend Marquis. <Mark, wait. laughs> But then, truthfully, when Samuel went, he said, I'm coming to celebrate it with you. So what he said, and he celebrated it with him. So it began like a lie, but it was manifested as truth. That's the closest I've seen God. Sorry. Is it that Rosie? She's not right there anymore. I mean, I tell you. She was in ISCF. All Christian fellowship. When they are coming, they come with their files. So, you know, you know, you know. Everything is prim proper. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's some people like that, though. But that's it. When I begin to talk this theology, some of them put their pen down. And I said, they are saying, in the name of Jesus, I bind the spirit of blasphemy. I bind the spirit of blasphemy. Oh, bind the spirit of blasphemy. Hallelujah. Hey. You have to come from somewhere. Somebody must be speaking into your life. Somebody must be correcting you. Somebody must be showing you the way. Somebody can point the way. But you need somebody. To. So, here's the principle. The Bible says from Abel Mehola. Number one, purpose started before your knowledge. God started doing something before you knew. Elisha, Elisha is doing something. And then the Bible says, God sent Elijah, go and do this. He didn't know he was going to be a prophet. So don't walk with the idea that everything that God has, is going to do in your life, he's going to start it by telling you there are things God can do with your life that he won't tell you. When Paul, Saul was born, he didn't know he was going to be an apostle. But then he met God on the road to Damascus. When Moses was born, he didn't know he was going to be a judge and a deliverer until he met him at the burning bush. When Peter had failed and was at the uh, lakeside Genesaret, he didn't know that he was going to be a fisher of men. Somebody came and told him that this is what you're going to be. See. And see this very properly. You need somebody. Sometimes a human being. And I said that information God cannot give it to you. When God gives it to you, you'll be in trouble. God is talking to Samuel. And God is calling Samuel. Samuel. And Samuel runs to Eli. God calls Samuel and he runs to Eli. Then the next time God comes, he says, Samuel, Samuel. That is a sign of desperation. God is desperate. Hey, Samuel. Then he runs to Eli. I want to kill Eli. Why are you running to him? Samuel. And he runs to Eli. Samuel, Samuel. That's a repetition. It's either a sign of desperation or it's a sign of uh, concern or it's a sign that you have not heard me properly. And then Eli, Eli said, uh, oh, Next time he comes, say to him, Master, speak for your servant ears. So it was Eli who gave Samuel the key to hear from God. So when Eli, put, Samuel put that key, Master, speak. 
for thy servant here. There is God panting behind you. <laughs> I've been trying to get your attention. You, you are not, that man you even want to see, I want to kill him. Why didn't God say, I am the one calling you. So, why are you running to Eli? God could never do. Jesus made a statement. And that statement Jesus made. Matthew um, 16, 17. Look at what Jesus said. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. My father has revealed this to you. Revelation can come from flesh. Revelation can come from blood. Revelation can come from a spirit. So sometimes God will reveal. By the way, I said a spirit. God can reveal and the devil too can reveal. So you have people, we call them Asem War. In Acts chapter 16, verse 16 and 17, the girl with the spirit of divination, she was not operating of God, but she prophesied and was giving people direction. And it was exact by the spirit. You walk and follow everybody who says they, they are spirit, prophet and prophet. Just walk and follow. Let them give you fear, prophecies that will put you in fear. Let them tell you, your mother is a witch. Your mother didn't chop you when you were in a in, in womb. But now that you are born, your mother. Let them tell you all sorts of things. And you walk around and believe that. And you will find out in the end. They will divide your family. And blessings that your mother or blessings that people are supposed to give to you, they won't give to you. Because they have separated you. For they come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And always with those people, watch the money factor. Watch the money factor. Because that girl with the spirit of divination, she was making profit for her people. Watch the money factor. Tonight I'll be speaking on Adadia Radio on the prophetic. But guess what? Eli, Eli, at least you are. He was at a place he shouldn't be. Don't play around some places. There are times when you're playing around some places, God has to terminate the play. Abel Mehola means meadow of dancing. That's celebration. Party, enjoyment, laughter, fun. And God came to terminate it and said, You have played in the valley of dancing, meadow of dancing for too long. Now get up. It's time for me to get you purpose. Sometimes God interrupts your party. God interrupts your, your, your nice, the party, the fun, just to bring you to a place of destiny. And you need somebody sometimes who will come and interrupt your fun. Sometimes God will cut away the fun because it's not time for you to be serious. If God wants you out of the meadow of dancing and ask for you all your life, you just want, you have believed that God who is always making people laugh. Eh, you need to get out of your meadow of dancing. Abel Mahola means meadow of dancing. You have danced too long. You have partied for too long. You have enjoyed all the nice things for too long. It's now time to get serious. The title of this message is Get Serious. Shall we rise? Lift up your hands.